Martin, first of all, thank you so much for being here at the 10th Annual Animal Law Review Symposium's third event of the semester. Today's event is the product of a collaboration between Lewis and Clark Law School's Animal Legal Defense Fund and also the Animal Law Review. We're also really lucky to have Lewis and Clark's Food and Agriculture Law Society co-sponsor this event today, so thank you. Uh, we're honored to have Lauren Ornelas here with us today to explore various interconnected abuses in our food system. Food system. After her presentation, we'll hold a Q&A. So if any questions or thoughts come up that you'd like Lauren to discuss, feel free to submit them via the Q&A function throughout her presentation. So without further ado, we'll get started. I'll introduce our wonderful guest speaker. Lauren Ornelas is the founder and president of Food Empowerment Project, which is a vegan food justice nonprofit that promotes veganism, fights for workers, and also works on lack of access to healthy foods in black and brown communities. She's been an animal activist for three decades now, during which she has launched numerous groups, investigated factory farms, run consumer campaigns, and also helped stop the construction of an industrial dairy farm in California. I will post in the chat a link to Lauren's TEDx talk about the power of our food choices and some other really important links about her work at the Food Empowerment Project. So thank you, Lauren, for joining us today. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and I think uh, you all have to bear with me. I needed to, need to share my screen to show my presentation. And that always gets me a little bit confused, but I know I can do this. I think. All right, everybody help me out here. Where do I go? Home, oh, no. Uh, go to the bottom of the screen on the right hand side. Are y'all able to see it? Yep. Yeah. Are y'all seeing it now? Yep, yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate um, being able to share, um, just talking about food justice issues, which I think is really important um, in the spaces that all of us are in. Um, I'm just gonna give you a quick quick entrance into my brain. So I'm just gonna share you briefly how I see all these issues are connected um, from my framework. And then I'm gonna go through and kind of break things down in a different way. But for me, food justice issues, um, especially as a vegan since 1988, I see all of these issues that was incredibly connected. And so when I'm going through this process and I'm asking you to follow me on my journey, the first one is obviously gonna be veganism, which is a main tenet of the work that we do at Food Empowerment Project, um, is why many of you are here because you care about justice for non-human animals. But veganism is really at the core. But as an organization that's encouraging people to go vegan for non-human animals, we're always very quick to remind people how the people who pick our food are treated, right? So what you're going to learn about, it's going to go from veganism and it's going to go to farm worker justice. Because as a vegan um, who went vegan for the animals, I couldn't ignore what was happening to the human animals as well. And part of that is, is all of us who are encouraging people to go vegan for the animals, we have to recognize the impact that us demanding more produce has on farm workers as well. So there's the first connection. The second connection is something that I fear the animal rights movement hasn't done a good job of doing. And that's um, talking about other injustices in the food system. So we say things such as this, this recipe list or these recipes are cruelty free. When in reality, if they have commodities such as chocolate in them, they're not exactly cruel. They may be vegan, they don't include um, the bodies of non-human animals, but they still include injustices to human animals. And then finally, I'll talk about, to me, another connection is one of the things that we do, we say going vegan is easy, when at the end of the day, it is depending on your privilege. But for many people, going vegan is not easy. And I don't think that's a huge hurdle for us to, to deal with when we're talking about these issues. Um, but the last issue that I see connected is food justice in terms of lack of access to healthy foods in black and brown and indigenous communities. So that's just kind of like the quick overview of how I see these things are connected and why I see that they're connected. 
And I do see this as a, a very much a vegan framework. Um, and again, overall, the work that we try to do, as many food justice activists try to do, is really just try to lessen the suffering. Um, for us in particular, we want to lessen the suffering of human and non-human animals. And we don't really see them as part of the food chain. Um, we see animals as not even necessarily needing to be there. So, and I'm going to go through this first one. I don't know where my slides are not moving. Okay. Um, hopefully y'all can see this is Quincy. Quincy is from Woodstock Sanctuary, Farmed Animal Sanctuary. And Quincy to me embodies why it is that Food Empowerment Project is a vegan organization. And that's because little Quincy here has a right to her own feathers without worrying about somebody using them for a jacket or a pillow. She has a right to her own flesh without worrying about somebody wanting to eat her. She has a right to feel the grass under her feet, to immerse herself in water. She has a right to live without humans inter interfering and trying to harm her. And that's really basically how we feel about all non-human animals, including fish, um, who a lot of people don't talk about, but fish very much um, deserve our protection as well, um, as do other um, sea creatures. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into um, veganism because this is the Animal Law Review and you all know about veganism, but just to say for everybody who maybe hasn't taken that step to go vegan, or maybe you have difficulty going vegan because of access issues, is that it doesn't really matter how big or how small a farm is. At the end of the day, they're still harming and exploiting animals. And I think the dairy industry is a very easy way to, to look at this, that it doesn't really matter how small the dairy is because at the end of the day, they're still separating the moms from the babies. And there's no separating that fact because they need the dairy industry needs and wants that milk to sell to human beings. So even if it's a small dairy, they're still separating families. And for me personally, when I first went vegetarian, when I was five years old, um, that was one of the reasons why, because I didn't want to be responsible for separating a family because I knew it was happening to my own and didn't want to cause that to happen to other beings. So as I quickly skip from uh, talking about non-human animals, just to talk a little bit about the pollution. And I'm, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the term environmental racism where this involves predominantly black, brown, and indigenous communities who are impacted by negative health pollutants. So we're talking about oil refineries, we're talking about toxic waste facilities, we're talking about the dumps, we're talking about communities where these facilities are overridingly in black and brown and indigenous communities, where our communities are left with various health problems. So in North Carolina, where you have the vast majority of pig farms, you have um, black and indigenous communities who are living near these farms. And if somebody's investigated pig farms, I can tell you that the stench is something that's absolutely indescribable. I can tell you when I investigated chicken farms, it was an ammonia smell and it burned my lungs. But when I investigated pig farms, the smell was something that is really difficult to convey to somebody. And this is what communities are living with. Um, people who are living in these areas suffer from nosebleeds. They suffer from headaches. They can't open the windows in the summertime because the flies are so bad. The smell is unbearable. And this also means their property values are pretty much worthless because nobody wants to live near these facilities. But again, this is where predominantly black and indigenous community members are living. And it's not too much of a different situation here in California where we have some of the largest dairy farms in the country where one farm can have up to 27,000 cows on it. And to, to try to break that down, I'm not really a numbers person. To me, it's very hard. I wasn't good at math. Um, and so, but to, to look at one cow, one cow produces 120 pounds of wet manure a day. So when you have farms that are that large, that is an incredible amount of waste that's being made by these animals. And here in these communities, you predominantly have the Latinx community living there who are suffering from the highest rates of asthma in the country and are dealing with things like they're, a lot of them are still getting water from the wells. It's contaminating their wells. So you go from looking at the impact that it has on the animals who are being killed, but also the communities who are predominantly black and brown and indigenous communities who are impacted by the negative um, health, the negative pollutants from um, animal agriculture. 
but again, this is when I always want to put pause for vegans, right? We're like, absolutely, you know, this is this is why people should go vegan. And it's absolutely true. But we can't have that type of attitude about where people get their food without acknowledging where we're getting our food. So we need to look at farm workers. Um, farm workers, um, so I'm 50 years old. The lifespan of an average farm worker is 49 years old. And this is because of the incredible working and living conditions that they experience. Here you can see farm workers leaning over, picking strawberries. Um, and this causes a lot of problems for their backs, for their joints. They are forced to work in extreme heat, extreme cold. Um, and they are not really being paid well. Um, some of them are being paid not by the hour, but they're being paid by how much they pick. So the idea of taking a break to get water, to rest, is not an incentive for them when they're being paid by how much they pick. This is why some farm workers die from heat exposure because they don't, they need to make the money. Um, you have sexual harassment being rampant in the fields, unfortunately. And um, again, a lot of these farm workers, because they make little to no money, a lot of them are homeless. They live or they experience homelessness, always learning with my language. Um, a lot of them are experiencing homelessness because of the fact that they have to live near the creeks. They have to live in cardboard boxes in their trucks. And um, I'm going to go into the, the next image that I have. But a lot of these farm workers also are uh, living maybe 16 people to a one bedroom. So when we look at COVID, and I, I live in Sonoma County, um, which is where the quote unquote happy cows are. It's also where the dairy industry is. And I sit on the Latinx work group for the county health department for COVID because our community has been the hardest hit by um, COVID, meaning the Latinx community here in Sonoma County. I'm a very proud Mexican. Um, so when you look at this chart, hopefully you can see that the percentage of people in the Latinx community um, that have gotten COVID is 76% and we're only 27% of the population. You can also see here that underlying conditions, many of people in our community had no underlying conditions. But I think what's really important to recognize when we look at the impact that COVID has had on the black and brown and indigenous communities is that there are things that are gonna come out about our lives and our lifestyles that don't come out with a blood test, right? So a lot of farm workers are not only dealing with the stress of their job, keeping a roof over their head, living in crowded conditions, traveling to work in crowded conditions, meaning they're all pile up in cars together. In fact, some of the wineries here, even during COVID, the farm workers have been living in bunk beds. In addition to all of that, many of them face the threat of deportation, right? With the Trump administration and obviously the Obama and other administrations haven't always been working to, to keep our undocumented people safe in this country. So many of them fear deportation. What does this do, right? What does living in constant fear and stress do? It lowers your immune system. We have the same thing with the black and indigenous communities because of racism being so rampant. So these things aren't gonna come out to you and giving a blood test, these are underlying issues, but they are there and they are real and they're impacting our people's ability to fight something like COVID because they are being stressed out about what's happening. They're worried that they have to work, right? I mean, I can tell you horrific stories that we hear in the Latinx work group about things that are happening in my own county about farm workers um, who are going to work sick, a farm worker who collapsed in the field between in the vines um, because he was sick and they told him he had to work anyway. And what is more, I'm sorry, I get, this, this is just my first talk since learning more about this, is the fact that many of the farm owners don't even believe that COVID is real, right? We had somebody in a position of power and many others who believed this idea that COVID was not real. So when their workers asked for things like hand sanitizer, they asked for water to wash their hands. They were laughed at and told COVID does not exist. And that's why so many of our people have been dying. You had a similar situation again here in Sonoma County, um, where we had some of the worst fires in the state of California going on, where you had farm workers being forced to work in the fire, in the fires, that sounds like they were in the fires, sorry about that, working in the fields when the fires were going on. So 
these are areas where people, residents were told these are mandatory evacuation zones. The fire is so close, it's so unpredictable, it's unsafe that residents need to leave. It is mandatory that you leave from these areas. And yet, the Farm Bureau figured out a way with the wineries and the dairy farmers on how to make sure that these workers would continue to work in mandatory evacuation zones. Again, implying these people are not human. And I, I'm keeping an eye on the time because I definitely want to leave part for Q&A, but I get really upset about this stuff, as you can tell. And it's like this thing that happens, and I think this happens in all industries, but most especially with farm workers. And people look at farm workers and they say, I could never do that work implying somehow that farm workers are superhuman, right? Not acknowledging that these farm workers are doing this work and the type of work they do and under the conditions in which they do it because of their families, because they want their families to succeed. They're still tired, they're still achy, they're still not feeling good, but they need to put food on the table for their families and that's who they do this for. One of the things that uh, Food Empowerment Project does, and I know some of you like Joyce have participated in this, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart, is that we do school supply drives for the children of farm workers. And we do this especially for their children um, to show them what superstars that they are, letting them know that we want them to succeed. And I wanna point out, we do not do this because we feel it is an act of charity. This is not an act of charity. We do this to help right an injustice that's taking place against farm workers. We're doing this because we cannot change the corrupt system by ourselves. We want to try to do something to make it better for them and who it is they're sacrificing everything for, and that is their children. So every year we do a school supply drive for their children. Last year we donated 665 backpacks filled with school supplies. We'll be doing it again this year with June uh, being the month that we'll be accepting school supplies for the children of farm workers throughout the entire month of June. If you follow us on social media or you're signed up to our e-newsletter, you'll get more details about that. So again, one of the other areas, and again, I think it's just really for us as vegans, because we do have a reputation, maybe right, maybe wrong, for being very, um, what's the right word, um, better than others. Um, word's not coming to me right now. Maybe it's the 50-year-old thing I had to talk about. but we come across as being better than everybody else. And I think by acknowledging that we know that there are issues in the food that we eat, we're breaking down a barrier and that allows us to communicate with people who aren't vegan, who maybe build that bridge to have a conversation. And when we look at chocolate, I feel like this is one of those issues because many people like chocolate. Uh, many people don't understand that chocolate is, is a luxury. It's not a necessity. And that many of us, um, some people eat milk chocolate. Those of us who are vegans may eat a different type of uh, plant-based milk chocolate, but we all eat chocolate. And we look at it as, in my opinion, I feel it's a responsibility of us to talk about what's happening in other forms of, of food um, that isn't related at all to non-human animals. It is simply related to the injustices that are taking place to human animals. And we have that very easily in the chocolate industry where we have children as young as five years old, but typically the ages are 12 plus working in the cacao industry. You have children who are stolen from marketplaces who are trafficked hundreds of miles away from home to areas where they don't even speak their local dialect. Sometimes these children come from very far states, near, I'm sorry, very poor states nearby, such as Burkina Faso and Mali. And in the Ivory Coast in Ghana, you have some of the worst forms of child labor, including slavery, taking place to over 2.8 million children. The numbers on that vary. Um, sometimes because the industry is so powerful, they're able to get the institutions that are releasing this data to lower that number. So it's a little bit tricky on what the number is, but, the, but what we do know is that children and adults are literally enslaved for the cacao industry. You see this picture here um, of, a, of a little boy. And sometimes these children are forced to carry bags of cacao. So that bag that he has would eventually be filled and maybe be about 100 pounds. And if he doesn't move, move fast enough, sometimes he's beaten. Meaning that children are often beaten with branches if they're not moving fast enough or quick enough, regardless how heavy it is of the things that they're carrying. These children are using machetes 
um, which cut their arms and their legs um, because it's a very heavy equipment. Again, that's not supposed to be happening. These children should be in school. And for me, this is the quote that got me looking at chocolate in a different way. For, for being a vegan for a very long time, when a reporter asked um, a formerly enslaved person, what would you say to people who still eat chocolate? Uh, the formerly enslaved person said, tell them when they're eating chocolate, they're eating my flesh. And this is when I knew I could not look at chocolate the same way again. I knew that if a non-human animal had the opportunity they would be saying the same thing to me as well. And that's why I went vegan. And that's why I kind of always say just because it's vegan does not mean it's cruelty free. So, oops, sorry y'all, still working with this. Um, so when we're also, when I'm talking about them being slaves, I do mean they are literally enslaved. I'm talking about the fact that these children are often locked in overnight. Um, that if they try to escape, they're beaten, that sometimes they cut open the feet of these children and adults to make sure that they don't run away. So this is an industry that has unbelievable problems that are still taking place right now today. In 2021, we have people who are being enslaved for chocolate. And I wanna mention that it's no longer just um, Western Africa, it's also Brazil. Brazil has recently popped up on a list where these problems are also starting to take place. And a lot of times people will say, well, these are children working with their parents, so therefore it's okay. So I always think it's important to point out this quote from a farm worker saying, if I didn't have this rope around my neck, my 12 year old son who works in the harvest would be studying. Again, parents want their children to be able to go to school. They don't want them working with them, but because of the industry, because these corporations refuse to pay them what they should be paying for their work, these farmers are having to rely on their children to help out. And this, this is not the system. This is not an equitable system, um, but this is what's happening. This is the reality for farmers, um, not only in Western Africa, but Brazil. So what Food Empowerment Project did is we created a list to help people, right? As a vegan, you know, I stopped consuming non-human animals because I didn't want to participate in their suffering and their death. And I feel the same way about chocolate. So what we did is we created a list of chocolates that we do and do not recommend based on the country of origin. So our list does not come from um, a certification. All the certifications have been found to be problematic. Our list is based on country of origin. And so I would say to you, so check the country of origin. And you'd be like, uh, this package that I'm eating doesn't say country of origin for my cacao. So we created this list to make it easier for you, what we call for you to eat your ethics. So this list contains the companies that we feel comfortable recommending and the ones we do not feel comfortable recommending and we explain why. Um, sometimes we don't recommend a company simply because they don't respond to us. Other times it's because they have the audacity to think that they don't need to share this information because it's proprietary. Now keep in mind when we're asking this question, we're not asking for the state, we're not asking for the city, we're simply asking for the country of origin, these companies will not give it to us. We have this um, free on the iPhone and the Android, and we really encourage you to download it. The app allows you the ability to reach out to companies and say, you know, I wish you, uh, I wish I could buy your product, but I can't because you're sourcing from areas that have slavery or child labor prevalent. Um, they allow you to thank the company for being on the recommended list and let them know why um, you're buying from them, right? Because the companies who are doing good need to hear that it matters. Companies that aren't doing good, they need to know that it matters to you because they think it doesn't matter. They think we don't care. It's happening across the country. And at the end of the day, I would say racism plays into that too. They don't think that we care what's happening. So we have to be there to show them that we do. And what I, I should mention right now is that your generation is fantastic, right? You are all why so much of this is happening and changing in our world right now. And I wanna thank you for continuing to show the powers that be that um, you want a different world and you want a different system than the one that you've been given. And I just wanna thank you and ask you to keep on fighting for that. Um, so the last part of the food justice realm that I want to talk about that I see is connected 
is um, the lack of access to healthy foods in black and brown and, and indigenous communities. I will preface here, uh, we haven't worked solely in indigenous communities. So what you'll hear me talk about is primarily black and brown communities, but the problem is the same. The problem is, is that you have an overabundance of liquor stores, convenience stores and fast food, and you don't have as many places to get healthy foods, whether it be urban gardens or um, grocery stores. And a lot of people call these areas food deserts. Food Empowerment Project calls it food apartheid because it is deliberate. Some of these are deliberate attempts to harm the health of black, the brown and indigenous communities. This is not happening by accident. And so we wanna make sure that we call it what it is. And um, again, this is why I will bring this part in my talk is why it's not easy for everybody to go vegan, right? It's just not. And I think that we can deal with that in a way that isn't too difficult with still being honest about the problems that happen. So Food Empowerment Project has done our work in a number of communities. The current one that we're working, actually we're working in two communities right now, but the one I'll talk about is Vallejo, California, which is in the Bay Area. And we were asked to work in that community by one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party. So I should step back and say, Food Empowerment Project follows environmental justice principles. We don't go into somebody's community and start doing this work. We want them to ask us to be a part of it um, because otherwise we shouldn't be there, right? It's up to the community. So what we do is we go in and we physically survey establishments for fruits, vegetables, meat and dairy alternatives, as well as other things such as do they sell liquor? What percentage is liquor? What kind of signage do they have in the windows? And we surveyed every establishment in Vallejo. And what we found out was that 88% of all the liquor stores and 71% of all the convenience stores in the city of Vallejo were in the low income communities, which are predominantly black, brown, and where some of the seniors are living. Overwhelmingly, it was in these communities. So you can see here that the vast majority of people were getting their groceries from liquor stores and convenience stores. The whole town of Vallejo has these issues. And I will say the entire community of Vallejo is very diverse. It's predominantly Black, Latinx, and Filipino communities. The entire community has problem with accessing healthy foods, but it's more dominant um, of a problem in the Black and Brown community. So in doing our work, one of the things um, we do, so we do focus groups in the communities to determine what the barriers are that people um, have accessing healthy foods. And one of the things we found was that it was the cost of the food. It wasn't as much proximity to getting to the grocery store. It was primarily the cost of the food. And as an organization that works on farm worker justice issues, we know we don't want the, the cost of food to go down what we need are wages to go up. So if we want a more equitable system, we have to increase living wages. I'd say over 15, but for now 15 is a good start, but we need to push for living wages. Um, so for all of us who want people to go vegan um, for non-human animals or for any other reason, for justice even, we need to all fight for living wages because people aren't gonna be able to do it because there's an injustice out there. There's an injustice in the types of jobs that black and brown people hold that don't pay as much as other jobs. So we need to fight for living wages, restaurant workers, fast food rest workers, Walmart workers, it doesn't matter. We need to do our part, right? To help create some equity and justice in the world. And we need to help fight for living wages. One of the other things we found was that people were eating healthier in some of their home countries. So what came out was that in our focus groups, we found out that many people who were immigrants were eating healthier in the communities that they were in. So they didn't necessarily want to um, get canned juice. Um, they wanted to have fresh orange juice. Um, probably the slide I should have included was one more about tomatoes. And that in their home countries, which were in the community we did, were probably Latinx community members, they were eating foods that they grew in their own, in their own gardens, and they were able to grow tomatoes. And the last thing they wanted to do was eat tomato sauce. Um, so again, an additional barrier is just people eating healthier where they were and transitioning to a country rife with racism and discrimination like the US. Now, we also surveyed for meat and dairy alternatives. And we did this because um, one, we're a vegan organization and we don't want harm to come to non-human animals and we want to 
see if these communities ha even have access to this. But we also did it because we know that diets higher in fruits and vegetables are better for you than diets that include a lot of animal products. So as you can see here, not many of the locations had um, access to meat and dairy alternatives. And the reason why dairy was so important for us to talk about, obviously, is because the cows, but also because of the impact that colonization has had on many of us and our cultures. So for me, as a very proud Hikonix, meaning I'm Native American, and so for my ancestors, um, there were no cows in the beginning, right? It was only when Columbus brought over cows and goats on the fourth voyage, did that even become a part of our diets. So the fact that I and many people like me can't digest the milk of another species, which is to begin with consuming milk of another species, we can't consume dairy is not because there's something wrong with us. It's a product of colonization and it's a legacy that trickles down to us even now. But Food Empowerment Project is very quick to want to make sure that oftentimes we are called lactose intolerant, but we're not lactose intolerant. Dairy is a product of, well, I should say animal milks are a product of colonization. There's nothing wrong with us. Um, the, the, the word intolerance implies there's something wrong with black and brown and indigenous people because we cannot consume cow's milk, but there's nothing wrong with us. We are lactose normal. At, in reality, there's something weird that a person can consume cow milk and have absolutely no problem with it when they are a completely different species. So we encourage people to use the term lactose normal, not lactose intolerant when describing our community. So one of the other things we found in doing our work um, in these communities was that Safeway Grocery Store has literally become a problem for communities accessing healthy foods. And for any of your lawyers out there who ever want to donate your time to an organization like ours, we would take it. But basically what's happened is, is that Safeway um, places what's called restrictive deeds on their former property that prevents other grocery stores from moving in. So when Safeway moved out of downtown Vallejo, which is where predominantly black and brown and seniors were living, they relocated miles away. And when they did this, they placed a restrictive deed on that property, preventing a grocery store from moving in for 15 years, absolutely depriving that community for 15 years from having a grocery store, where teenagers didn't even know it was like to have a grocery store because most of their food was being bought at the liquor stores and the convenience stores. Again, we're talking about communities where people sometimes have to take two buses to get to a grocery store, in addition to many working two to three times, two to three jobs, because they're not only time poor, they're cash poor. So um, we have a campaign called Shame on Safeway um, that if this was a, for a non-human animal, we know we would have hundreds of thousands of signatures by now, but we ask you to please sign and share our petition. Um, but I want to mention for those of you who live in Washington state, this is an ongoing problem right now in Bellingham, Washington, where they've put a restrictive deed in a community there that's predominantly a farm worker community preventing a grocery store from working in that community because of them. So I'm going to skip, I talked about our focus groups. Um, so some of the solutions that we see in, in this work when we're looking at lack of access to healthy foods is community, right? It's all about community. And so we feel that people growing their own food is a definite solution to this problem because the food system was never really created for black and brown and indigenous people to thrive, right? It was kind of created to live off of our blood, sweat and tears. So getting off a system like that is gonna be better for everybody if we can grow our own food. In addition to that, we strongly feel that worker-owned cooperatives, um, we're very big on worker cooperatives and worker unions. Um, and so worker-owned co worker cooperatives allows the people who work there to be the owners. So they're the ones making the decisions on their profits. They're the ones making decisions on what they sell, what type of breaks they wanna give the community. So we work very closely with Mandela Grocery in Oakland, and we're trying to bring something like that to, to Oakland, I'm sorry, to Vallejo. But again, this is where we create our own destinies, where we in the community are the ones who make these decisions. And as we all know, having a voice in your community, in your job, whatever it may be, is them for everyone. So um, just what you can do. So again, if you have access to healthy foods and you don't wanna hurt animals, go vegan. So if you're a vegan, you're like, you know, I talk to people about going vegan. 
Um, and I hear what you're saying about never, everybody having access. How would I answer that? You know, one of the things that we try to do is say, if you have access to healthy foods, go vegan, right? because we wanna acknowledge that not everybody has that access. And it's a very simple thing to do. It doesn't change anything. We wanna encourage people to shop with care, um, to not support corporations that violate human and animal rights. We have a list of co some companies on our website, but we're talking about the bad ones, the really bad ones, right? Like Nestle, like Coca-Cola, um, who are very bad when it comes to um, human rights abuses. Lend your voice to the needs of the farm workers. Right now, the farm workers are asking us to boycott Wendy's. Don't care if they have a vegan burger. They won't sign the fair food program called by the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, simply asking for one more penny per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. The farm workers are also asking us to boycott Driscoll's berries because in San Quintin, Mexico, they're not treating them right. So those are two boycotts that farm workers are asking us to do that we are amplifying their voices and asking you, please boycott that and tell the stores why you're boycotting those products. Choose organic. Uh, now, so we know, right? If you're a vegan, you know that just because it's um, cage-free eggs doesn't mean that the chickens were treated, the hens were treated any better. The same thing with organic, right? Doesn't mean the farm workers are treated any better, but it does mean that they're not being doused with agricultural chemicals. So if you can, and I know it can be expensive, try to buy organic. Um, we really ask you to use our chocolate list and our app. If there's a vegan chocolate that you love that's not on our list, just send us an email and we'll look into the company and we'll, we'll post an update on our, on our social media about it. Think outside the bottle. Please try to use um, single, uh, avoid using single use water bottles. We know it's not always possible for every community, but if you have the ability, please do. Bring your own reusables, um, buy local. If you go to the farmer's market, I want to encourage you to please shop from black and brown farmers. They are up against a lot more hurdles than other farmers are, so please support them. Um, again, please support living wages. You know, we post a lot of things on our social media and our e-newsletters about way that you can add your voices to this, so hopefully you'll see it in your own community as well. Um, check out our website. We do have more information on bananas and coffee and palm oil and wine as well. Um, speak about these issues of food injustice. All of these issues are important and it's really important we get the word out because as we know, it took a long time for many of us, for people to understand what was happening to non-human animals and the internet has really helped that so people can watch themselves. There's still a lot of injustices going out there that we need to be there to get the word out about. Fill out the comment cards, speak to managers, do all that you can to get the word out. Get involved. We have um, ways that you can get involved with Food Empowerment Project. We have a monthly e-newsletter that we'd love for you to sign up for and spread the word. Um, we have leaflets that if anybody wants any, we have them in English and in Spanish. And our website is also fully, um, has all of this information plus a lot more, all the different animals broken down from bunnies to ducks um, and uh, sea creatures as well. And our website is also in Spanish. We also have vegan Mexican food, which is in English and in Spanish. And we have a vegan Mexican food booklet in English and in Spanish, as well as having a vegan Filipino um, website, which is in English and Tagalog, um, which we also have the recipe booklets in vegan and Tagalog. And if you want any of those for free, feel free, I'll say feel free again, to email us and mention that you heard about them in this talk and we'll send you them for free. Just let us know what languages you want and which book. I also want to add that we are also working on vegan Lao food right now. Uh, one of my colleagues is Filipina and one of our board members is Lao, um, which is why we do these additional sites to make sure that we're all able to talk about and um, celebrate our cultures. Um, veganism will celebrate people who are interested in going um, vegan and wanting to try out some delicious food. So that was a lot. And I know I ran through it fast because there's, I definitely want to give time for Q&A. And I know that um, there's a lot there, but I just want to make sure that, first of all, I hope a lot of you are able to digest all of this. Um, I guess that could say that was an intended pun. It really wasn't. Um, but more than anything, these, this seems like a lot and I get that, right? And I just ask for you to look at these issues as opportunities, try to make a difference. It may be overwhelming, but if you have the privilege of eating several times a day, 
we just ask you to wield that privilege with information and making sure that you're eating your ethics, that it's not a matter of um, eating and not thinking, right? We need to be more conscious about where our food comes from, but more importantly, we need to do something about it. So, you know, to me, it's not just about these individual choices that we make, it's about using our collective voices to make a difference. And again, um, with this younger generation, I thank you. And I really look forward to you helping us uh, make some serious changes in the food industry. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much, Lauren, for that informative and incredibly engaging presentation. So now is the time for the Q&A. If anyone has any questions, please submit them in the Q&A function for Lauren. And it looks like we already have some, so we can get started. Uh, someone wrote, I am curious to hear about examples of successful models where communities with limited healthy access to food transition to community-led food production, for example, community garden models. I've been interested in this topic and I'm looking for models of how to build more local and sustainable food systems that displace oppressive food systems. That's a great question. Um, the main model that I know of, and if anybody else knows, I hope you'll chime in, but the main model that I know of is actually in Cuba. Um, where they have done an incredible job of creating community gardens to feed everybody. Um, a lot of the situation here in the US is that, um, well, we have so many problems here. Um, but I would say that, you know, there isn't a lot of land for everybody. Um, so in places like New York, that has been working on this issue for a long time and is doing great work. I don't know if they have enough land to feed everybody. I could be wrong. There's tons of incredible work going on like here in Washington and people like that. Um, but I don't know if it's enough to feed everybody. I know here in California where there is more land, it's incredibly expensive too. So I don't know of any models. That's not to say that there aren't any, but it's definitely something that we're trying to encourage more of because we feel like too many times the solution is looking at the top down instead of the bottom up. And community is truly, truly where a lot of the um, strength lies. And um, then people will know what kind of food, and I didn't go into it, but all of our survey tools for food, make sure that the food is culturally appropriate as well. Great. Um, we also have a question about, so someone is definitely appreciative of the decades of experience that you have working to address these issues. Um, and they're curious, what gives you hope for the future of our food system? And do you think that the events of the past year have led to a change in people's understanding of and awareness of these issues? Kind of why or why not? Um, this, this, this younger generation gives me hope. Um, this younger generation gives me the absolute most hope because um, the, and I will speak specifically to the animal rights movement, um, because I would say that I could, I'll start, I mean, I could also just start with the Parkland kids, the, you know, the kids who were, who survived the shooting at their school on Valentine's Day in Florida. Um, they pretty much, they just ratcheted, they just made everything so much better, um, by just showing their force, their determination, their inability to say one or the other to show that all these issues matter and to talk about them bravely. But in the animal rights movement, I will say that the young people again give me hope because they're the ones who really took the movement to task on the Me Too stuff. And I applaud them for that. And I see them doing it again right now with the unions. And I incredibly applaud them for that. It's not easy being the first one. And I thank them for doing that. Um, and they give me hope um, that we can make this movement more about being single issued, more about equity, more where everybody feels safe, where people don't feel like they have to leave a part of them behind, a movement where they feel that their values can be embraced, where they can feel safe and heard and valued. And so that gives me a, an awful lot of hope. Um, but in general, about the whole, um, the whole everything in the world, I, I do. Um, it is hard to have hope some days, right? I mean, it's very, very hard um, with the pandemic and so many people dying right now. Um, police brutality, not changing a, a wink at this point. Um, but I think everybody becoming an activist to some extent and looking at it as their responsibility to help everybody else. Again, that's not everybody, 
but certainly the people that I surround myself with and that gives me hope. Yes, thank you. Um, we have a question about how high cooking temperatures of meat is known to cause a lot of vascular complications, including so dietary issues um, and that it can lead to cardiovascular disease. There are carcinogenic effects of meat. So the general question is, do you think that the FDA would consider requiring non-vegetarian products to have warning labels about this as they do for cigarettes? It's an interesting question. Um, I don't know. And I just, I'll just say, I don't know. I would think that an area to look into that would be the EU because the EU always seems to be a, a little bit ahead of um, the US on many things related to this. Um, yeah, that would be interesting. I'm trying to, it's one of those things that's like so out of my purview. I'm sitting here like, I just kind of want to think about that. I don't know. But if I think of something before this is over, I'll, I'll say it. Great. Um, so next is, could you maybe talk a little bit about CAFO workers or recommend any resources that you for folks wanting to learn more about CAFO workers rights violations? Um, I mean, we have some information on our website um, about this. Um, the one thing I just want to stress is that I, I get a little bit concerned when vegans uh, and animal rights activists are only want to talk about slaughterhouse workers or factory farm workers. And it's not because they don't deserve our attention because they 100% do. But my concern that we are using them, that we're exploiting them ourselves to talk about these issues and that um, at the, if, if farm, if slaughterhouse workers were all of a sudden to be paid living wages, they were given breaks, they were given health care, and everything was fine. If you tell yourself you would still have a problem with it because they're still killing the animals, then they are not your concern, right? Your concern literally are the animals, which is great, and it should be, no question, but please don't use uh, slaughterhouse workers and factory farm workers to make our point. I'm not saying that's what that person was doing, by the way. I'm just saying it happens a lot, but we do have a lot of information um, on our website about that. Next is, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about the beer industry. I know that beer is exploding in Sonoma County, similar to up here in Portland. And I'm curious about any equity issues and sustainability, kind of anything that comes to mind in that realm. I don't know of any, and I'm here in Sonoma, and I haven't heard of any because I think it would probably be how the hops, I'm gonna act like I know anything about beer when I really don't. The sustainability issue with wine is gonna be the fact that a lot of wine is not vegan because of the filtering process. Um, and then also because the grapes, it's the grapes. So I think it's just a matter of um, knowing more about how the hops are harvested, but I don't know that, sorry. It's good. We're getting into a lot of topics that are, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So I have a question about the pandemic and whether the pandemic is affecting access to whole foods, plant-based diets, and are people really just trying to survive and get by now? And do you know if there are any studies that are being done about that? There's a lot of studies being done on the pandemic, um, specifically farm workers, but also access issues. And um, people are having a really hard time um, we just posted yesterday a picture of a farm worker on our social media who has COVID, who we delivered food for, and how she doesn't get out of her house, you know, and um, it's really bad. I don't, I mean, it's hard to know what to say. What we've done is we've been having food delivered to farm workers. Um, it is a problem overall. People are um, making choices because a lot of them are, you know, aren't working. Um, and of course, the government isn't really helping that at all. Um, so they're making choices between electricity or food. Um, you'll, the, a lot of the um, food banks um, are, have been drained. Um, again, this is where I rather people look at the root of the problems and not food banks. You know, let's create a system where people should be getting paid time off if they're getting sick. They should be being paid if they can't work, but no, no fault of their own. Um, but yeah, it's been really, um, really sobering. One of the things that I hope for that has come out of the pandemic is that many of us experienced when we went to the grocery store not being able to buy what we wanted. I went to the grocery store, there was no tofu, there was no rice and beans. And this is what some communities live through all the time. 
right? Because they don't have access to healthy foods. And so my only hope that can come out of some of this is more compassion and understanding and empathy of what it's like to be able, I mean, many of these communities, what they have is grocery outlet. And if any of you have ever gone to a grocery outlet, you know, you go one day and then you go a week later and the food's completely different that they're selling. That's no way for somebody to be able to create a meal plan for themselves. So um, yeah, the, the food situation has been very hard um, for people and we've done our best um, to, to get food to the farm workers um, who are feeding us, but there's a lot more to be done. Just a couple more questions. Sure. Um, so someone asked how many more people could be fed approximately, if you know, uh, if we eliminated beef and freed up thousands of prime quality acres that are currently devoted to corn? Um, well, I don't know. And I would say that, that there's not a lack of food in the world. It, it's not that there isn't enough food. We have enough food to feed everybody. It's a matter of, the, matter of politics. And so I know sometimes that vegans and sometimes organizations make those arguments, but at the end of the day, anybody living in those situations knows it's a matter that the, the governments aren't getting them the food. We have enough food in this country. There's no need for anybody to be going hungry, but they are. Every day, people are going hungry and we have enough food. Great, so I think we're just gonna have one more question and that is what can we do to support Food Empowerment Project after today? Huh. Thank you. Um, well, I think that, you know, we always accept volunteers. Um, we always could use donations. Um, if anybody wants to volunteer, we have, you know, we actually have um, an attorney who was, uh, had a student ALDF chapter um, who is on our board. Um, and so it's very cool to have people volunteer with us and then make it to our board. Her name's Elise Ferguson and Joyce connected us. So thank you for that, Joyce. Um, but um, I think that, you know, any, in general, cause I'm not, it's so hard for me to like food empowerment project. It's just like, use our list, you know, think about your food as much as you have thought about your food for non-human animals. And I sincerely thank you for that and talk about these issues. Please try to allow some of your, your platform, if you're on social media, talking to your friends and family about just some of these other issues, because we need to get the, the information out there because it's not out there right now. And so I think that you can help us by sharing our stuff on social media, talking about these issues, understanding, you know, that our food choices um, can have an impact beyond veganism and things like that. Um, so yeah, I think I'm rambling at this point, but I think that's about it. And again, you know, just thank you all for um, being, you know, wanting to become lawyers and wanting to advocate for non-human animals. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's wonderful. It's heartwarming. And I know it's going to be a lot of work for you all. And it probably is a lot of work, but thank you so much for doing it and for um, being such a great change in the world. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you again for this incredibly impactful presentation. And thank you to everyone who came today to learn more about the inherent exploitation and inequities in our food system, but also what we can do about it. Um, so before we depart, I just wanted to highlight that our next symposium event is the same time next week. It's Wednesday, February 17th at 12.10 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Dr. Aisha Akhtar will be discussing the human and non-human animal impacts of animal testing, the challenges in shifting away from animal models, and then also what we can do about animal testing going forward. So thank you so much again, Lauren. Thank you everyone for coming and we'll see you next week. Thanks everybody. <laughs>